All right, so welcome everyone. I know we still have a few uh, trickling in, but I do want to get started. Uh, we do have a jam-packed uh, presenting series today, so I do want to get started right away. Uh, welcome for those who do not know me. I'm Jen Swan from Art Services Initiative. Uh, we also have the team from ASI on this call as well. We have Holly Grant who will be moderating uh, Q&A and the chat feature. Um, and so feel free to add any thoughts or ideas or questions in there as we go along with our presentation today. Uh, this is our third reopening together session. So this is the third one in the month of June. Um, and we're really excited to jump into this third week because for those of you who were able to join us uh, the last two weeks or maybe only week one or only week two, uh, we've been able to cover a lot of ground. Uh, week one was really focused on general guidelines and principles from the state, uh, things that we've been hearing, uh, safety plans, uh, thinking about what you need to go through in order to reopen your organization. And then last week, we really broke out into multiple different artistic disciplines and really talking about and sharing ideas between those groups about what everyone is going through as far as preparations, task force, um, ideas, working with their staff, working with their boards. Uh, so really today is a result of a lot of what we were hearing from those last two sessions or maybe trending questions that we've seen on different topics. Um, so we, we picked our speakers today based on that to help take you to the next step <coughs> talking about uh, reopening. Uh, as a reminder, we ask that you leave your video off and your audio muted throughout the presentation. Uh, any questions will go into the chat box and we'll monitor that we'll monitor that throughout the, the session. We have until 2.30 today, but feel free if you need to leave earlier than that, obviously you can. Um, we are recording the session, so please be mindful of that as you ask questions and, and we'll really compile all this information and follow up with the recording with everyone. Okay, so as everyone knows, um, we're nearing phase four of New York's reopening. Um, but I do want to remind everyone, even today is, is the green light for phase three, but I do want to remind everyone that just because we're here talking about arts and cultural groups and reopening, this doesn't mean that once phase four comes, whenever it comes, that you have to reopen. So really using this information as a guide, um, but still really looking at your organization and thinking about what makes the most sense for you, your programming, the audiences that you work with. If you can open in phase four, great, do so. And you feel that that's the right decision, that is your decision, um, but also, you know, you don't have to. So we're not using this as a platform to say you have to open right at phase four whenever that date comes, but just getting you thinking about what steps to take leading up to that. Uh, I also do want to remind everyone, as I do every time, uh, ASI is not offering legal advice. We don't have any final authority or say on guidelines, safety procedures. We're essentially just taking all of this information and making it easily accessible for you so that you can use that to make informed decisions. So today we're following up from the first two weeks to address some of the questions and concerns that you brought up during our discussions. We are excited to have several speakers today. We have Phil Stokes, Executive Director of Penn Dixie, and their board chair, Frank Scarpinato. And they're going to talk about their reopening plans, policies, and experience to date as they are open. Uh, later after them, we have Joy Testes and Quino from the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. And she's going to share their experience as well as an indoor venue um, and, and what they've been seeing as they reopened. And then finally, during the second half of our presentation, we have Les Greenbaum, who's an intellectual property attorney with Gross Schumann PC. And he's going to join us to talk about copyright and required licensing for virtual performances and programs. And that's actually a result of a lot of discussions we've been having about reopening as an in-person physical experience while you still, you still may have the ability for your organization to do virtual programming. So still talking about those opportunities. Um, so to kick it off, I will uh, turn it over to Phil first and Frank, or if you want to, if you want to go simultaneously or one at a time, um, they'll turn on their cameras and or mics as they see fit. And I will turn it over to you, Phil. 
Thanks uh, so much, Jen. I, I just have to start by saying, um, you know, I really appreciate what ASI has done in the past and what ASI continues to do for the arts and cultural community. Um, your help was instrumental in uh, growing our organization, and I'm very happy to, um, you know, hopefully give something back here in the form of sharing uh, our own or organization's experiences with the arts and cultural community. So, so thank you, Jen and ASI. Um, so um, I'll, I'll share with you um, some slides here that I put together and I apologize. It's been pretty crazy these last few days as we reopen um, and we've been overwhelmed in a good way uh, with a lot of uh, positive feedback and interest from the community. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about how we got to this point. Um, so um, uh, if you'll just bear with me a second, I will uh, lo load these things up here. Um, and uh, I believe, uh, believe I'm loaded up here. So, um, all right. Um, so <laughs> I had to title this uh, reopening. Uh, uh, you know, who imagined that this is the position we'd be in, uh, you know, six months into 2020, uh, trying to figure out um, how we can completely change our business model, our practices uh, and our operations uh, you know, not even to, uh, you know, do better than in the past, but basically just stay in business. Uh, so um, it's stressful time for everyone. And um, I really <laughs> want to acknowledge that uh, we're all in this together. So just to give you an overview of our organization, Pendixie, our mission is hands-on science education. Uh, we own and operate a 54-acre fossil park and nature reserve. Uh, our annual budget in a typical non-pandemic year is $300,000. Uh, roughly a third of our revenue is from government sources. Uh, two thirds are generated by programming, memberships, merchandise, donations, and grants. Uh, each year we uh, count on roughly 20,000 participants to help us with our mission. Uh, and that includes about 5,000 K-12 students on school field trips. Uh, in 2019, we had two full-time staff uh, and 18 part-time staff. Uh, this year, uh, we added a third full-time employee right before the pandemic, um, but due to uh, our, our loss of revenue um, and most of our programs being canceled, we're only able to bring on uh, nine part-time staff. And we use a seasonal model. Uh, you know, basically our facilities are open from April to October, uh, and then the rest of the year, we're either doing community programming or regrouping and writing grants and planning for the future. So when we had to shut down, um, we lost quite a bit. Uh, March and April was a big time for us to do community engagement uh, and school outreach. Uh, April, May, and June, we lost all of our school field trips. So all 5,000 kiddos who'd be coming out no longer visited Penn Dixie. Uh, and this is also our 25th anniversary season, which uh, you know, you couldn't really ask for a worse uh, season to, <laughs> to celebrate your anniversary. Um, uh, roughly May 16th, uh, so we all know about the PAWS uh, Act and uh, the executive orders that keep coming out. Um, one, one thing, if you're, if you're following the news, uh, the, the executive orders seem to change day by day. Uh, and roughly May 16th, uh, New York State Executive Order 2026 was modified to now include parks, uh, and low risk outdoor activities as essential businesses. So this was maybe a bit uh, surprising that, uh, you know, we, we were going along um, thinking about, okay, uh, when can we reopen? And then all of a sudden uh, we can reopen. Um, now, prior to May 16th, um, we only had members uh, at, allowed to access the park. Um, and we were able to retain our staff um, to work on maintenance projects thanks to uh, the payroll protection program. Um, and, you know, we could have opened on May 16th, but we were not ready for a number of reasons. Uh, so we selected June 1st to give us time to prepare. So I just wanted to share with you, um, if you're operating an outdoor venue that sort of falls along these lines, this is what that section of the executive order guidance looks like. Uh, so if you see at the top, uh, parks and other open public spaces, including playgrounds and other areas of congregation, and it goes on and on and on. Um, but generally, you know, I think if you're operating, uh, say, like an outdoor, outdoor park that does like art uh, or, or some sort of low risk activity, which, of course, is up to you to determine, um, <laughs> you know, these, these cases are uh, sort of general 
uh, bullets in here. Um, but really, uh, you know, we didn't fall into any of them. And so we said, well, um, you know, how, what, what's our best fit here? And, and really our best fit was along the lines of like a state or a county park. Uh, and so we uh, looked very closely at the guidance for those types of facilities. Um, now, I, I recognize that the arts and cultural community also operates some very unique uh, uh, facilities with, with uh, unique missions. Um, and so, so really, I think it'll be up to your leadership to figure out, you know, just how you fit in, uh, whether you, you know, if you are outdoor, maybe you uh, luckily fall under one of these categories. Um, or if you're waiting for phase four, um, you know, that's fine too, because you actually have some time now to learn from the places that are open uh, and figure out best practices now so that you're not doing as much trial and error. So uh, one question that, that we got from uh, some of our employees was, what about like our gift shop or food? Um, and so uh, it wasn't clear at first, um, but the guidance has since been updated. So these types of services may be offered as long as they are allowed in your region, given the current reopening phase. So for us, uh, our gift shop is retail sale uh, without curbside because we have no curbs. So um, we weren't doing the gift shop until uh, retail was allowed to reopen, which has just happened with phase three. So we're beginning to bring our gift shop back into operation. Uh, we do not have a food service um, and we don't have drinking fountains. Um, so we made bottled water available and we assumed that this was okay. So when we were preparing to reopen back in March, uh, you know, once the shock of closing and everything, uh, you know, uh, subsided, um, we looked at uh, other parks and businesses for good and bad ideas. As you probably know, literature was scarce at first, but has grown. Uh, and I really leaned on Disney. Uh, you know, they're, they're like the gold standard for tourism. Um, and so, so we took some hints from Mickey Mouse. Um, I will also add that uh, medical advice is sometimes inconsistent. Uh, if you follow the news, there seems to be some disagreement between the World Health Organization and the CDC. Um, and so we took the approach that uh, it's better to take more precautions uh, than fewer. And generally speaking, our guiding philosophy is that the safety of guests and staff is most important. Uh, inconveniences are preferable to infections, closure due to staff illness, exposure to negligence claims, and bad publicity. Sometimes, I'll add, sometimes the public does not seem to understand that. So our reopening plan uh, is really a living document. Um, and this is a function of the fact that the health guidance uh, continually changes, um, but also as we uh, move further and further into reopening, uh, we're learning more and more about which policies work really well and which policies might need to be adjusted. So we wrote our plan uh, actually before New York State provided a template to businesses. Uh, and this is partly because there wasn't much else to do, um, but really because we wanted to be in a position to reopen as soon as we could. Now, we reviewed all of our operations to examine the risks uh, for infection and solutions that we could find. Uh, we asked our staff and board for input uh, and then uh, this reopening plan and the template were posted to the New York State website. So keep in mind, uh, the template is something that all businesses in New York State are mandated to complete and post to their website. Um, our reopening plan is really far more detailed than the template. Um, and I felt that it was important to post that alongside it as well. So some things to consider for your organization. Um, and these are our points, you know, where you're going to need to put yourself in the shoes of someone else. So imagine you're looking for a safe place to take your family. Is your organization's reopening plan easy to find? And will that plan put your visitors at ease? Now imagine your employees are afraid to return to work. How will you keep them safe from the public? How will you keep them safe from each other? And does reopening improve their job security? Also consider, imagine you're visited by a health inspector. Is your plan thorough? Is anything missing? And most importantly, are your employees following your plan? Now in the litigation world, this last uh, point will be fairly important. 
Um, and since there's not a whole lot of guidance from the federal and state government about uh, responsibility uh, other than businesses are responsible, um, you know, basically we need to, uh, you know, cover our bases. Um, there's probably not going to be a protection uh, from claims as far as I can tell. Um, so imagine someone claims to have caught the virus at your facility. You have a legal duty to care to ensure the safety of your guests. Now, was this duty breached by your negligence, recklessness, intentional act, or omission? These are the questions. Uh, disclaimer here, I'm not an attorney, and this is not legal advice, um, and I'm borrowing these definitions from, from Cornell Law. So uh, the de definition of negligence is a failure to behave with the level of care that someone of ordinary prudence would have exercised under the same circumstances. This behavior consists of actions, but can also consist of omissions. So the example, uh, a couple examples that come to mind. Uh, let's say your visitors remove their face coverings in high traffic areas. Employees are aware of the problem, but do not intervene. That could be negligence. Another example, a sick employee comes to work, risking the safety of others. There's a really good uh, uh, case, a good instance of this in the news. And when I say good, I mean, uh, it highlights the, the legal uh, exposure. There was a, uh, a national chain of hair cutters uh, who had employees come to work with coronavirus. They had flu-like symptoms. Uh, they, uh, I believe, reported it to the ownership. And the ownership said, well, you could keep coming to work. We'll give you the test. Turned out they were positive for coronavirus and uh, dozens of clients were exposed. Now, fortunately, it appears that none of the clients who were exposed actually caught the virus. Uh, but in my view, this is a serious uh, uh, claim uh, where, where there could be a potential, uh, uh, or sorry, say serious exposure where there could be a claim for negligence. For the record in this situation, not a lot of people have, not a lot of the clients have been tested, but thankfully the clients that have been tested are negative. Thank you, Frank, for sharing. Um, so recklessness is another uh, uh, risk. Uh, so recklessness is behavior that is so careless, it is considered an extreme departure from the care a reasonable person would exercise in similar circumstances. Example that comes to mind, you plan a large event, <laughs> right? That's pretty reckless. Uh, another example, uh, your plan states that your capacity is limited, but you do not take steps to control your admissions. An intentional act, uh, in legal terms, this is also known as a tort. Uh, so an intentional act is a type of tort that can only result from an intentional act of the defendant. So an example, in this case, a disgruntled employee coughs on a guest something you want to avoid. And lastly, an omission. So failure to perform an act agreed to, especially if there was a duty to perform. So the example that I've come up with is that you claim your, uh, that hand sanitizer stations will be available to visitors. But upon arrival, your guests find that the sanitizer stations are empty. So these are things that we wanted to avoid in our reopening plan. And I'll share with you um, some of the major points. Um, and then uh, you're more than welcome to visit our website, pendixie.org. And front and center, you'll find uh, some uh, broad guidelines as well as very detailed uh, information that you could download. So our park is 54 acres. Um, but really, most visitors congregate in a few uh, smaller regions. And so we actually used, uh, with a, as an outdoor venue, uh, our, our park appears on uh, satellite and air photo imagery. So we used a geographic information system tool provided by Erie County to calculate the area uh, of the main fossil hunting uh, space. And so this area turned, uh, turned out to be about three acres uh, or 140,000 square feet or about the size of 2.4 football fields. So given social distancing of six feet, each visitor would need a perimeter of 12 feet, right? You need six feet on one side and six feet on the other side. So this equals 
144 square feet per visitor. So we could simultaneously host 972 visitors given this limitation. But as an extreme precaution, we limited ourselves to just 25% of this number or 243 guests at any one point. So really each guest gets about 600 square feet. Uh, for parking, we, we have a pretty large parking lot too. Um, and we decided that we wanted to take advantage of that. So we greatly increased the spacing between vehicles. Uh, we eliminated double parking. Uh, we marked our parking spaces where in the past they were not previously labeled. We installed signage. Uh, we discouraged our visitors from loitering. Um, we put in some additional gravel in a few places so it would be easier for people to get in and out. Um, and we wanted to minimize staff interaction with motorists and vehicles. At our registration booth, we installed trans pla uh, transparent plastic barriers. And as you could see here, we came up with a system that uh, is easily removable um, and also will resist blowing in the wind. Uh, we switched to online only purchase of admission tickets and we do not allow walk-ons. Uh, now, one thing I will add, uh, since I think we're all, uh, you know, uh, we're all on, on one side of the business and not, uh, you know, the members of the public, um, so please don't share it. Um, but if someone does show up without uh, a reservation, uh, as long as we have the capacity, we will take them on. Um, however, we're not advertising this to the public because we really don't want a lot of people showing up all at once. Now, our visitors are required to read and acknowledge a complete list of rules and procedures. Uh, and this was set up in our uh, ticketing software. So they had to go through uh, and check a box saying that they read everything. Uh, we also have a paperless, uh, paperless check-in process. Uh, we're currently only accepting credit cards. Uh, and our registration area is also set up for social distancing. Uh, we have a timed entry every 30 minutes to prevent bottlenecking. And then uh, finally, our tickets sold during the first half hour of each day are reserved for high risk populations. So people with mobility impairments or some sort of breathing issue, uh, or if they're older, uh, we really wanna give them a chance to get in and have the experience uh, safely. Now for our employees and visitors, really uh, sort of the mutual goal is, is keeping them safe. Um, so all of our guests uh, and employees and volunteers are required to wear a face mask or covering. Uh, visitors without a mask are not admitted. Uh, thanks to a grant from ASI, as well as a donation from the town of Hamburg, uh, we're able to offer disposable masks at no charge. Uh, employees also wear gloves when they're cleaning, handling commonly used items, and working with commonly used surfaces. And our employees are divided into teams. So one day there might be a given uh, team working, the next day it'll be a different team. Uh, this procedure was designed so that if there is uh, an infection, someone does get sick, uh, the other team we can presume uh, won't have uh, caught it from that first team and so we won't have to shut down entirely. Now for sanitization, uh, we have a three month supply of a substance called styramine, which is an industrial sanitizer used in the restaurant industry. Uh, it's a little less abrasive than bleach, um, and we've in, uh, used it in these uh, lovely uh, garden sprayers that you may, you may recognize from, uh, from other purposes. Um, and uh, we regularly spray bathrooms and commonly used surfaces. Uh, we also soak our hand tools in this substance, um, and then our plastic barriers where visitors are checking in get sprayed daily. We've also set up social distancing with our bathrooms. Uh, and you'll notice uh, some of the state parks and county parks, I believe, have switched to only using portable toilets. Uh, the idea here um, is that uh, if you have a community bathroom, you can have multiple people in a very small space exchanging the virus. Uh, so really a portable toilet has the benefit of allowing only one person at a time uh, and should reduce the risk of spread. Uh, and I put up the sign, I'm very uh, proud of it. We wanted to set up, uh, the, the reason here is we wanted to set up a toilet that was just for our employees. Uh, like I said, we wanted to keep them safe from the public uh, and also um, you know, give them a sense of security in the workplace. And so I came up with this creative sign 
uh, basically saying that due to the frequency in which our employees are exposed to the public, uh, we want to keep uh, them uh, away from uh, your, your facility. Um, you know, they, they may have a higher risk of getting infected, and so we want to uh, do all we can to keep them safe. Um, so it's a two-way street here. We're keeping our visitors uh, in, in a happier mindset, and we're also keeping our, employers in, our employees in a happier mindset. Um, we had uh, initially opened with a rule that face coverings would be required in every space. Uh, but we found that we actually had uh, so much room that it really, and people were, were following social distancing very well, um, that we could restrict that, uh, or sorry, um, uh, ease the restrictions. Uh, and so uh, we changed it so that a face covering is only required in the most highly trafficked areas of the park, which happened to be the parking lot, uh, the area near the check-in pavilion, and sort of the, the main uh, trail into the fossil dig area. Uh, and to uh, remind our visitors, we, we put up additional signage so that could, uh, they could see where masks were optional versus required. Now, I will add that every visitor who arrives uh, receives a safety briefing uh, of these rules. Uh, and basically, they are uh, re reminded uh, you know, that if they uh, cannot follow them, they will be asked to leave. So our plan uh, kind of mimics the New York State reopening plan. Um, we came up with a bunch of phases and uh, of course they're color coded. Uh, so these phases really uh, were designed to give us a chance to adjust and to learn from what was working and what wasn't working. Uh, so our phase zero was staff training. Uh, and, and as you can see, it was a two day procedure. The first day was uh, virtually uh, training all the employees. And so we went through our reopening plan, we went through the state guidelines, uh, and we discussed them uh, as a staff. Um, there were some places where we decided to change our reopening plan or details of the plan uh, based on staff feedback. Um, and really, it was just an opportunity to get everyone on the same page. Then our second day of training was in person, uh, where we went through each of the new safety measures with the employees. Uh, we also had some mock situations uh, to talk about uh, and to really train people on what to do in, in certain gray areas uh, that may come up. So phase one, which we began June 1st, was uh, members only. Um, and it was pretty slow, actually. Some days we only had a couple of visitors. Um, the most we had in any given day was about 15 people. Um, and we learned quite a bit to use in, our, uh, in updating our uh, reopening plan um, and, and really get us prepared for working with the public. Uh, the benefit, of course, is your members are, are kind of like playing to the home field. Uh, and so you would hope and expect that they are maybe a little bit more sympathetic to uh, some more extreme safety measures and are also willing to give you the patience uh, to sort of figure things out. So phase two for us began on Monday, so yesterday, June 15th. Uh, we welcomed the public back. Uh, we offered some limited tours. Um, and things seem to be going pretty smoothly. Um, one thing to note is that each of the subsequent phases will depend on our overall health in our community. So as long as we keep the spread of the virus down, uh, we should be able to move into later phases and continue to allow additional visitors. So how did it go? <clears throat> well, uh, overwhelmingly, the feedback was positive on our social media, um, but we did have a few grumpy comments uh, and and I'd, I'd, I'd like to say that um, uh, those folks are really uh, in for an awakening when they realize that, uh, you know, every business and organization uh, will be adopting uh, measures to, to protect their visitors and employees. Uh, we happen to be one of the earlier groups, and so we got some uh, negative feedback. Um, unfortunately, I believe the Buffalo Zoo has also gotten some negative feedback. Um, but really, I, I don't think the folks who are making these types of comments are, uh, they, they don't really understand what's involved in these, these types of business decisions. And, uh, you know, frankly, they'll probably, uh, you know, if they can't uh, make these adjustments, they'll probably spend their summer on the couch. Um, so I'll say that our staff loved and appreciated the safety measures, and they also had great feedback. Uh, there was no one who was apprehensive about returning to work uh, with all of our measures in place. Uh, we had also uh, an almost overwhelming amount of new and renewed memberships over the past few weeks, uh, which is a good problem to have. 
Um, most of our visitors uh, support these measures. Uh, they're just happy to get out of their homes and do something fun and educational. Uh, and out of about 165 guests we've had in the past two weeks, only two of them complained about face coverings. Now currently, um, I got to say we are inundated uh, with inquiries from the public and members about making reservations, uh, you know, booking times, and, and really these new measures. Um, we've done our best to try to get the word out there and, and make it as simple and straightforward as possible, um, but there's still some confusion about these new policies. Uh, for the longest time, our organization was, was pretty much a come as you are, uh, so people showed up whenever they wanted and uh, really uh, there weren't so many rules. And now with all these rules in place, um, it's creating some more challenges. Uh, and I'm very happy to report that our revenue is slowly creeping upwards. Uh, not quite where we would expect it from in a normal year, um, but we're slowly being able to uh, see some positive results. Now, one unexpected challenge that came up uh, has to deal with security. Uh, and, and really, I'm sure you know, so kids don't have school, adults are somewhat working from home or unemployed, uh, and there's way more people uh, than usual out and about in the neighborhood. Now, or, our organization is kind of nestled in, in this suburban uh, neighborhood. Um, and so we've really seen a lot more trespassing and vandalism this spring than in any other time in recent memory. We've also had some jerks uh, riding ATVs and dirt bikes. Uh, the cops came and chased them out. Uh, and sadly, we, we do not have uh, footage of this, uh, although I imagine it was pretty entertaining. Uh, we also installed some new fencing and security cameras, um, and these measures seem to be working. Um, so things to keep in mind for your organization, you know, if you're outdoor based uh, and there's a lot of people milling about, um, you may need to change some of your policies and upgrade your security to deal with these sorts of problems. Now I'll share with you, um, just completed uh, this uh, fun uh, video that our, uh, one of our board members put together that we're planning to share with the public. Try it again. So um, yeah, if uh, you have a, a capability to do the same type of thing, I would encourage you um, to maybe make a short clip that you can share with your members and the public. Um, I think people appreciate um, humor and authenticity, um, and really uh, they're going to be very eager to come out and support your missions. So um, that's it for my presentation. I'm going to uh, turn things over to our board chair, Frank Scarpinato, uh, who's uh, somewhat of a, uh, a health wizard, uh, and he will uh, uh, have some insights to share with you as well. Uh, well, Phil, thank you. Um, first, I got to say, uh, at the beginning of this year, when I took over as chair, I absolutely did not in any way have any idea that uh, we would be here talking about this, trying to figure out how to safely conduct business with our clients and with our staff. Um, I, I was expecting to be moving into a capital campaign. 
uh, which I do believe we've hit pause on. Uh, unless somebody's got a couple million dollars they want to loan us. Um, but that having been said, uh, I have been blessed with really great staff. Phil has really been proactive uh, and he has listened very well to my input. Um, I do work for Erie County Department of Health. And for the last 14 weeks, uh, I have been, uh, we'll call it knee deep in the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, and there are some things that I have learned over the course of this, and I'm gonna share some of my experience. Uh, I do wanna make it very clear. I am not speaking for Erie County in any manner. I'm not speaking for the health department, nor am I speaking for Erie County. But I am going to share with you some of the experiences I have uh, and some of the things that have turned out to be best practices for us. Um, first off, do not do something that is going to endanger your staff or other people. Uh, absolutely most important. Masks are a requirement. Um, you know the old saying, no shirt, no shoes, no service? It is now no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. Uh, if you have somebody who comes in who has a problem with it, they must leave. Um, that incident with the hairdressers that Phil referenced, everybody was wearing masks. And so far it looks like there was no transmission of the virus from two sick people to dozens of clients. Uh, that's very important. At the very beginning of this epidemic, uh, one of the tragedies uh, that's, that really took place at the early part of this epidemic, we had a chorus or a choir that had 61 members. One gentleman came to that meeting, or that practice, wound up infecting over 50 other people at that choir practice, two of whom have died since. I want you, when you're figuring out your plans and when you're deciding what's right and what's wrong, to say to yourself, how many people am I willing to injure or harm? My answer is zero. And I know Phil's answer continues to be zero also. Uh, and that's why we have taken every precaution possible for our organization to protect them. Uh, I do know we have groups out there that have 50, 60, 100 people in them. Um, for those courses that wish to practice that have 100 or 100 plus people, uh, talk to Phil. We have a very large open space in our parking lot. Uh, during our off time, we might be able to space you out about six feet and you can use that to practice. Um, otherwise, you're not going to be able to jam 100 people in a room. If you don't have a football field, you can't do that. Uh, do expect to be operating at least at 50% capacity for the year. Um, tracking. So one of the questions I got was, um, contact tracing. The way it works right now, you better have a list of everyone who has come through. Um, we have the electronic online, so it tells us at least who's been there and how to get a hold of them. Uh, if you are contacted by a contact tracer who says, listen, there was a person who was there and they were sick, you need to reach out to everybody who was on your site that day. Make it easy on yourself, make it best for yourself to be able to just pick up an electronic file and just go, okay, Bob, Bob was here and this is his phone number. Joe was here, this is his phone number. Jen was here, this was her phone number. And be able to reach out to all of those people rapidly and quickly. Um, it will help slow the virus, but more importantly, will help you guys be able to control uh, the message out there. We don't want anybody being called the, the cause of the next, the second wave or the third wave. Uh, we'll leave that to the states that are opening too quickly and too early. Um, one of the, let's see. Um, so as far as contact tracing goes and training in that and HIPAA training, uh, I'll be reaching out to Jen and Holly uh, to provide them a name at Erie County that does a lot of this training. Uh, and I'm sure 
Um, I don't want to speak for her, but I know she's awesome. Uh, I'm sure she'll be willing to work with you guys to, um, to establish a training program. Uh, it could be something as simple as one of these trainings, or she'll refer you to something online. Um, do understand if you are told that you had a contact when you were reaching out to let people know that there was an exposure, uh, you're not allowed to say, oh, well, you know, the guy who was at the front desk checking you in, he was sick. Uh, you just can say, all you can say is there was someone on the site who tested positive for COVID-19 during their infectious period, you were there. And that we recommend you go get tested. Erie County is doing free swab testing. Uh, so and that number is 858-2929. Uh, some of that is going to be moving online. Uh, I want you to understand if you think you need a swab test, go get a swab test. If you have staff who or participants who may have been exposed, make them stay home. Um, this, this is about controlling the disease and minimizing risk. Uh, some of the things I talked to our people over in Epi, I had a uh, requirements and guidelines for uh, reopening the creative industry. At this point, until New York State issues it, uh, all we can do is look at what's been issued for the others. I can guarantee you if your industry or your, you know, your program has close contact with other individuals, uh, that you're not going to be able to keep a six foot distance. You are going to be required to get swab tested every 14 days until the next phase begins. Uh, that has happened with the phase two group, which were the hairdressers. They wound up getting at least two swabs before phase three, which began uh, today, initiated. Now, everybody in phase three who have to get swab tested, those people are uh, people who work nails and uh, nail salons, stuff like that, massage therapists, uh, physical therapists who have close contact. Uh, they need to get tested on a regular basis. Now, um, those are some of the things that I know for fact. I also want to explain a few other things that are very, very important. Um, when it comes to concessions, you're going to be required to follow the county health rules, plus whatever's laid out in your plan, plus whatever New York State lays out. Uh, if it's in your plan, follow it. Don't, again, don't risk yourself or other ones. Um, I had a question here about, you know, an example, what about garden walks? If you can do it in a safe manner and you can spell it out in a plan how you're going to be able to do it in a safe manner and how you're also going to be able to track participants, not only the people who host it, but the people who came through the event, I don't think that you're going to have a significant problem moving forward with that. But if you can't show New York State that you can track everybody who rolled through there, um, they might have a problem with that. Now, some of the other things I have found uh, at work through my job is uh, turnaround on these testings is three to five days. So if you have a staff member who goes out and gets tested the next day, which doesn't happen very often, usually they have to wait three or four days. Uh, they're not going to be back to work within three days. They're probably going to be out for at least a week. Uh, so if you, they're suspected and they get tested, they're going to be out for at least a week. Um, what were some of the other questions I had on here? Uh, as far as PPE goes, it is becoming far more available out there. You are expected to wear it. Um, I understand some of these conditions can be a little difficult. It can be hot. It can be uncomfortable. And sanitation, don't do the bare minimum. Do as much as you can. Uh, I, I'm ex-military, and I had a sergeant who would see you standing around, and he would walk up and hand you a broom or something to dust with. Um, it's good to keep your staff busy. And right now, the best thing they can do is walk around, wipe stuff down, spray sanitizer, clean things. Uh, that will be a best practice. There's a lot of things we won't be able to expect until it's here. 
Uh, New York State has a tendency to change the rules at the last minute or a week after they've published it. So stay tuned. Um, again, I want to really thank Phil. Phil has really been a strong point to work from with our organization. Uh, I know our, uh, our policy is online. Please take a look at it. Me and Phil developed most of this before anything came out using what we knew to be best practices at the time. It is extra cautious. Uh, and I think that's right. Um, I don't have anything else, you know, certainly I'll stick through to the end to try to answer any questions that I can. Uh, again, I am not officially speaking for the county. I'm just sharing some of my experiences from my work at the county. Uh, and, you know, all our organizations are looking forward to being back to full. Oh, the other thing, with this pandemic, this is a marathon. Um, we at the county are planning for a minimum of 12 more months of this, if not more. So for your organizations, it is not unreasonable to expect that you plan for at least the next year or two to be dealing with this. Uh, so at that, I'm going to cede my time or my spot. Uh, I will be on through the end so you can ask questions. Thank you so much, Frank and Phil. That was that was great information. Um, we did have a few questions through your presentation, but I do want to move into Joy's presentation and hear from her first, and then we'll ask a few questions related to um, all three of your presentations, because then the other half, we will move into uh, hearing from Les from something a little different outside of reopening, but looking at virtual programming and, and the impacts of that. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Joy. Thank you, Jen. Good afternoon to everyone. And Phil and Frank, that was very interesting. Thank you. Behind me, I don't know if you can see her or not, is our library director, Mary Jean Jakubowski, that will jump in if there's something that I need to add. And I know, do I have 10 minutes? I know time is tight. Am I good for 10 minutes? Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. That's not where I want to be. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, so three months ago to the day on March 16th was the last filled day that public libraries located in the city of Buffalo were open for business. It's really easy to get lost in what was supposed to happen and what we were supposed to be doing 100 or so days ago. We were supposed to, I'm just gonna give you a quick laundry list here, unveil and celebrate a new library card. We were supposed to launch a discount VIP program that included probably a handful of culturals that are on the phone right now. We were supposed to close a major rare collections exhibit and open a new exhibit about children's books that will come hopefully in the next few months. We should have welcomed dozens of school children who visit the library as part of their end of the school year downtown days programs. We would have offered hundreds of children's teen adult and family programs in person throughout our 38 uh, member library system, including a bookmobile. We would have promoted National Library Month, Poetry Month, Library Workers Week, and a whole lot more. We also would have participated in an outreach with our bookmobile and staff, including at job fairs, parades, senior centers, and more. Well, it was winter time and life was good, or so we thought, right? Well, between March 16th and June 5th, Buffalo and Erie County Public Libraries pushed out no less than 12 messages to the community, the media, and our patrons. And that doesn't even include messaging guidelines, procedures that were emailed or sent to the homes of our staff. Beginning with notices about short-term library closures to temporary closures per Governor Cuomo's directives, to Wi-Fi locations available outside libraries, to extending due dates of library materials, which FYI now are not due until June 29th, to lists of open drop boxes, to finally this month offering walk-up and now open libraries in the city of Buffalo. Hooray. 
um, one by one, day by day, as we all know things were changing, my goal working with our director as well as our five other administrators with advice from our legal counsel, the CDC, the World Health Organization, the Erie County Health Department in New York State was to disseminate information and push it out to our target audiences. We've done our best to connect to our constituents. We quickly got up to speed with virtual online programs, with dozens of programs weekly. Our librarians became film stars, something they were just not used to. We quickly put together something that was long awaited, an online e-library card for the borrowing of e-content, which we also increased the collections of. So where are we today? Well, 20 of our 37 libraries are open with limited services and 14 are offering some type of walk up or curbside service. We're grateful to have come this far. And as you may know, many pieces needed to be put into place. This is um, where you can find our, um, our Buffalo and Erie County Public Library reopening and safety plan for COVID. As New York State, Erie County, and local governments phase out their stay-at-home orders enacted in response to COVID, the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library was faced with new challenges, as we all were, regarding the safety of our workers and our patrons. To reduce the risk and exposure of COVID-19 in the workplace, the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library developed and implemented proactive prevention measures in addition to existing standards and has a, a coordinated communication plan policies, procedures for all our staff um, prior to re-entry to the workplace. All practices and policies comply with federal, state, local laws and executive orders. And we'll talk about those in a couple minutes. So if you come into the Downtown Central Library or any of the City Buffalo libraries today, um, you're gonna see a lot of signage out there. And so one of the things that was most important for us to do is the messaging messaging about the expectations for not only the public but for our staff. So here's two just reminders that people have to wear their face coverings. One is on the outside of our building and there are dozens and dozens in the inside of our libraries. Um, public and employees must wear face coverings. And uh, as I said, we've installed a lot of signage everywhere. These are, these are two happy uh, library patrons that came the first day we were open. We unfortunately had to remove flyers, pamphlets, at least temporarily to help reduce the spread. So in places where you may have walked in and gotten information about other community events and activities, those racks are now unavailable. It may be hard to tell on this slide, but we have installed plexiglass, very nice looking plexiglass shields at the service points throughout our city libraries. They're attractive and in general, the staff does like them. They're there for safety and protection. You know, libraries are all about community, but we had to, um, for the safety of everyone and for social distancing guidelines, remove chairs, uh, rearrange furniture in our computer sections. What we're not at the computer section one slide yet, but we also put up vinyl, um, vinyl circles to separate the, the six foots for social distancing at our uh, public service areas. We put out sanitizer in strategic places. This is right in front of a copy machine. Our staff is equipped with uh, disinfectant, paper towels. Um, this is something that a, a library patron could just use. Libraries are really all about community, but our meeting rooms are closed and we're not offering public programming, something that we will, will reassess in July based on any new social distancing guidelines. We are now quarantining uh, returned library materials for 72 hours to ensure the safety of our patrons and staff. Um, this is one of those things patrons are not accustomed to. So we've got this posted in several places and we're letting people know that once they return an item, no one is touching it for 72 hours. It will not go back on the shelves. This is one of the important messages for our 300,000 library card holders. And by the way, when I talked about that new e-library card that we just started, I wanna say at the very end of March, 
we now have 2,000 new e-library card holders just since the pandemic. So people want and wanted and continue to want their library services. So where are we today? In most cases, all of our full-time and benefited staff are back to work or will be back to work um, this, this week and in the coming days. The first day back on the job, all employees receive a return to work packet of info. I'll get a mask, hand sanitizer, tissues, notices about face covering, social dis distancing, how to protect oneself. Um, they're given information about expectations. If they feel sick, they need to go home. They have to wash their hands, um, avoid touching face, call, email, or video conference as much as possible. When we walk in the door every day, there is a daily health questionnaire that must be completed upon entry and our temperature is taken. This is for all employees. There's um, some logs and each department is responsible for their own logs and making sure that there is cleaning and disinfectant, disinfecting happening in each department. Um, we have logs that we are responsible for uh, supplying to our maintenance department. Libraries will adhere to hygiene and sanitation requirements from the CDC. So we've looked at, continue to rely on, and gave our staff um, copies of information from the CDC. We've got regular cleaning, disinfecting um, daily in high transit areas through our maintenance department and through our staff. And we're providing disinfecting products that have been identified as effective against COVID-19 by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, just two websites. If you haven't been them, been on them, you need to get on them. I'm thinking probably everyone has, but I thought um, I would include them on here. Is the the uh, New York State Governor Cuomo's uh, HTTPS forward New York, which has all the updated information that does change, and then the CDC website. Um, the library used much of the information from CDC for our flyers. So there are Spanish language, there are English language, things that we've put in restrooms, things that we've put in hallways, things that we've put um, in front of closed uh, um, water fountains and things of that nature. Oh. Supposed to be one more slide there. Okay, I'm not sure where my last slide went, but um, let me. Stop sharing. Okay, so, um, you know, what's next? Our reopening plan is continuously being modified. And that really comes through our director's office and our human resources department, um, you know, just within the last 24 hours, we heard that New York State is relaxing public gathering rules for regions to permit up to 25 people. It was 10 people. So that's one of those areas where we need to figure out what that means and how does that affect and impact our libraries. And that's my presentation. Do you want to add anything, Mary Jean? Okay. Should I be looking at the um, questions? Um, wait, thank you, Joy. Yeah, um, we had a few questions. I, I, what, I, what I do want to do with the questions that we had, I'll, I'll open it up to, to you and Frank and Phil, um, you know, whomever wants to, wants to answer. Um, I know early on we had questions about masks and also enforcing uh, mask wearing. So the two questions, and I'll, and I'll sort of pair these together and feel free, whomever would like to answer can answer. Uh, for you and other businesses, do you have extra masks to give or sell to people who come to visit? And then a separate question, kind of dovetail off of this a little bit. How does your staff enforce beyond asking someone to leave if they're not following those rules? And what if they refuse? So, um, masks are available out there. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that are producing some reusable ones. Um, and, uh, 
Uh, I know Erie County has been doing some mask distribution, uh, mostly through their uh, legislators. Uh, they, they do have some available through them, so you can always reach out to them, uh, see if there's some availability. Uh, another really important thing, though, is if somebody doesn't want to wear a mask, that's fine. They do not have to come to your organization. They do not have to participate. Uh, like I said, the rule of no, no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service is in the best interest of you, your staff, and your other, you know, your other clients or participants. It is very important because that is the best way we are reducing the spread of the virus right now. So if they don't like it, they don't have to participate. I know there are some people out there that are going to want to argue. They can leave the property. Um, I, I hate being cold about it, but you know this is this is no different than if I saw somebody behaving in a manner on our site that was going to injure or harm another person. I was good. I will ask them to stop, and if they don't, they will be removed. Uh, and I think every organization just has to accept that as what you've got to do. Uh, um, hi everyone. Uh, Joy's going to move away so I can take my mask down. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for letting me be on the call today. Um, great information, um, Frank. That was really great. Um, we in our Buffalo Branch Libraries do have uh, security guards. We have a protocol in place that if somebody is refusing to wear a mask, other than for medical reasons, and there is a medical accommodation in the executive order, which is very important to be aware of, um, we certainly will ask them to leave. We have instructed our security um, that it, and our staff, if somebody is argumentative about that, we will call law enforcement. It's not where we wanna go, and we really haven't had any problem in the couple of weeks that we've been open. Um, but it is something I agree with Frank wholeheartedly. It needs to be enforced. Safety and security of both our staff and our patrons is very important to us. Um, so, you know, with that, I think that, uh, you know, most people, most people, I always say that with a big smile on my face, really want to be um, cooperative and abide by the rules that are set forth. You know, right now we are a public building, so we are considered a um, public institution. Um, and the executive order is very clear. It's the law. You have to wear a mask in our organization. So um, we do side with that um, and that certainly can help. Thank you so much, Mary Jean and Frank. Um, one more question here in regards to masks. How does ADA rules work with masks in the current situation? So I don't know if Frank wants to answer that or if you want me to answer that. Um, honestly, you, I think you already covered it with the fact that the executive orders make accommodations for individuals who cannot wear masks. Uh, otherwise, you know, with other than those accommodations for individuals, it's a mask on policy. And, and by accommodation, I just want to jump in here. What we have been advised um, through discussions with our legal counsel you know, an accommodation doesn't mean you have to necessarily, in, in our case, and we're completely different than many organizations, um, very different, of course, than Penn Dixie, um, but we can see if there is another way for us to provide our services to that individual so that they do not have to enter our building without a mask. Um, so if they're looking for materials, for example, for us, books, CDs, whatever, perhaps it is we can accommodate by bringing those materials out to them on a curbside service. Um, if it is providing, you know, internet access, we have Wi-Fi available around our buildings. And so there are alternate ways of providing services that can subsequently meet that accommodation and really be a compromise for everyone involved. Great, thank you. Um, I do wanna ask one more final question before we head into Les's presentation. I do wanna leave time for that, um, but it's in regards to volunteers. So what are both of your organizations doing about the return of volunteers? So we have not returned any volunteers um, at this point in time, um, that purposely because our goal is truly to get our employees uh, back to work. Um, we certainly cannot bring volunteers in in lieu of having employees work, 
Um, so we have made the determination we are not prepared yet to have our volunteers back in our building. Yeah, I can, I can, uh, you know, kind of echo that, you know, where our priority was, um, you know, staff safety and everything. Um, and, and we have, uh, uh, in an extremely limited uh, case, uh, allowed one or two volunteers back, um, but they have to follow the same rules as the employees. Uh, and really the, you know, the problem of not having any programming uh, also uh, eliminates most of our volunteer opportunities. We, we require our volunteers to adhere to all of the policies and standards of our regular employees. They, they literally are held to the exact same rules in the employee handbook as anybody else. So uh, this will be no different. There was a question about a mask and children under the age of two. Um, the directive, the executive order speaks specifically to you over the age of two. Um, being required to wear a mask, and that is how we are employing that exactly. Um, if a child, if a child appears to be, um, you know, over the age of two, we certainly are leaving some to parental discretion. A three-year-old, sometimes you can't tell the difference, so that's a parental discretion thing. But clearly, if a seven or eight-year-old, somebody, you know, a child looks clearly over the age of two, we will be asking the parent to make sure that they have a mask. And we do have masks available that we are distributing for those who don't have them. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Mary Jean, Joy, Frank, Phil, thank you so much for this first uh, part of this presentation. It was extremely helpful. And I think many of the organizations on the call will learn a lot about everything that you're going through and really look to you and use you as the models of um, kind of going through that process and what to expect. So we thank you very much for, for being a part of this. And without further ado, we have Les Greenbaum on the call. He's from Grow Schumann PC. Uh, we asked Les to speak on copyright and legalities around um, live streaming. And so there's been a lot of discussion in our last couple of sessions about moving from an in-person performance uh, platform to now that um, you know we're, we're trying to keep six feet apart and and leave spacing um, how do we transition some of our programming into the virtual world but I think there's a lot of implications there that we may not realize or, or anticipate as we switch to that platform and so I'd like to introduce Les to um, share with us a bit about that and we'll take some questions about that at the end uh, Les feel free to unmute yourself when you're ready and um, join the group here. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, hello everyone. I wanna thank uh, Art Services Initiatives for asking me to participate today. Um, you know, first I need to uh, give a disclaimer that you know, what I'm saying is not legal advice. Uh, this is purely an informational and educational program and the information that I'll be sharing with you uh, pertains not only to the works that may be created that you want to put online, but also uh, what it is that you may need to get a license for or permission for in order to use as you move from a live performance into an, an online or recorded format. Um, and there are some materials that Holly shared uh, today when she sent you the link. Uh, they look like this, and uh, although that appears to be backwards, um, but the, uh, there are some basic copyright concepts that I think it would be helpful to understand. And that is that now, normally, uh, copyright does not apply to something that's ethereal. Um, you know, if you're uh, sitting in a park and strumming a guitar and singing a song or reading a poem or making a speech and it's not being recorded, uh, that's not something that is uh, protected by copyright or that you know, uh, someone uh, who, whose poem you may be reading or whose song you may be singing uh, would really be uh, in a position to complain about. Uh, on the other hand, if you're 
uh, doing a public performance and you've got a hat on the ground or you're selling tickets uh, or you're being paid to perform by um, that, that theater or that restaurant, uh, then you are uh, engaging in a public performance and, uh, and that is something that uh, those uh, owners of underlying materials may have rights in. So first we should talk about what types of works are protected. Uh, and under the copyright laws, they are original works of authorship that are in a fixed tangible form of expression. So what does that mean? Well, it's not the ethereal, you know, sitting on a park bench by yourself and, you know, playing your guitar and singing a song. That's not a performance that's in a fixed, tangible form of expression. It's not uh, a painting. It's not a sound or video recording. It's not a computer program. It's not a drawing. Uh, in addition, copyright, uh, when you're talking about uh, the copyright material that's being protected, it is not, if, say, if it's a work of uh, fiction or a work of facts, it is not the content uh, per se that is being protected, but it is the expression, the manner in which the content is protected. So there are certain types of, you know, uh, ideas and there are certain types of uh, materials that uh, are as old as the hill. Uh, if you've got a, a, a babysitter at home uh, watching a couple of small kids and suddenly she gets the phone rings and there's no one on the other end, that's a, a plot device, what's known as a scene affair that has been used many, many times and no one has the exclusive right to protect that. Uh, another example might be that you have a group of freedom, freedom loving uh, peoples who are being oppressed by um, an evil uh, governmental force. And um, you could even uh, have put that uh, in outer space or in a galaxy a long way from here. But if you start using things like, you know, Han Solo and Chewbacca and Yoda and um, it, other Star Wars elements, now you're treading on the expression and not just the content. Uh, so uh, copyright uh, does not uh, protect, you know, short phrases or titles or fonts or uh, systems. It protects original works of authorship in fixed tangible forms of expression. Um, and these uh, the categories include literary works, musical works, dramatic works, <clears throat> including any accompanying music, pantomimes and choreographic works, uh, but interestingly, uh, not Bikram yoga, yoga poses, although a film about uh, Bikram yoga poses might be protectable as an audiovisual work. And um, musical works are also distinguishable from sound recordings. There may be one musical work, uh, Yesterday by uh, Lennon and McCartney, uh, owned by a publishing company that's now part of the Michael Jackson estate. Uh, that's one musical composition that is entitled to copyright protection as a musical composition. There may be a thousand recordings of the musical composition Yesterday, each one of those recordings is entitled to protection as a sound recording, as a unique work. Uh, however, the uh, persons who wish to distribute those musical recordings of yesterday need a license from the publisher to make that recording. And if that recording is going to be played as part of a public performance, they will, that whoever is in charge of that public performance venue will need to uh, have a performance license, primarily from a uh, performing rights organization such as DMI or ASCAP. So as you move from uh, your live performance venues where 
uh, if you're a theater company or if you're um, a, a bar or a restaurant where you're used to having musical performances or theater performances and you move into an online format or you're moving into a recorded format, you need to determine whether the licenses which you've obtained uh, are uh, going to cover that additional type of performance or you're going to need to determine whether you need a, a broader form of permission or license than the one that you've originally obtained. So that brings us to what are the rights of copyright owners? You know, so you've got this work in a fixed, tangible form of an expression. It's yours. Now, what can you do with it? Well, uh, you have the right to make copies or phono records of your musical composition. Uh, you have the right to prepare derivative works. Well, derivative works are basically works that are based on a pre-existing work, but they are recast in or transform or adapted in some way. So uh, an example would be a, a novel and you know, you've written the novel. Um, nobody has the right to make a motion picture uh, based on that novel without uh, your permission if you continue to own the rights in that novel or to get permission from your publisher if you've assigned those rights to a publisher. And if you, someone has made a movie and uh, someone else decides that they would like to make a television program uh, based on that movie, well, uh, then does uh, that allow, uh, the, the, then there's another license that needs to be obtained to make the television series. And if someone wants to make a computer program, either about the novel or about the movie or about the television program, that is again another type of derivative work for which you know permission and or a license needs to be obtained. Uh, in addition to preparing derivative works, uh, do you, you have the right to distribute copies or sell them to the public? That you have the right to perform the work publicly uh, if it's a, a work of art. Uh, you have the right to uh, you have the right to uh, display the work publicly. Uh, for sound recordings, you have the right to perform them publicly or uh, on the radio or license other people to do that. And for certain works, and I apologize for this, <laughs> uh, you have the right to uh, have, for a work of uh, fine art, you have a, a right to attribution and you have the right to uh, the integrity and not to see that work uh, in certain circumstances uh, altered or damaged or destroyed. Now, uh, copyright claimants uh, would normally be uh, the original author. Um, you know, she who authors the original work in a fixed tangible form of expression has the right to be the copyright claimant. Uh, but there are also collaborative situations where there are co-authors and collaborators. Uh, and importantly, there are also what are known as works for hire. These are works that are normally provided by employees within the scope of their employment. Uh, it, uh, typically, if it's your job and to work as a graphics person in an advertising agency to provide uh, graphics for uh, publications that your agency is producing, the agency as your employer owns the rights to those works. Now works for hire can also uh, extend to works of independent contractors and freelancers. Uh, typically if there is a written a agreement uh, providing for those works to be works for hire. Um, if also certain types of specially commissioned works um, you know, I hire you to uh, create uh, maps for my book, or I hire you to uh, provide costumes for my motion picture, even though you're not my employee, in those circumstances, uh, some of those uh, works and designs and the derivatives of those works and designs 
can belong to me as the hiring party. Now note that for works for hire, the statute lays out some very specific categories that can be covered as works for hire. And not all categories of works uh, necessarily fall into the, the categories that would allow them to be deemed works for hire. So in many instances where uh, you will be engaged uh, or specially commissioned to provide certain types of works, uh, you will also be asked to sign an assignment of rights. Uh, and it's sort of a belt and suspenders approach uh, that are used by hiring parties to make certain that uh, they are acquiring all the rights that they need to use your uh, creative products in connection with their enterprise. And I'm sorry if I'm going along rather quickly here, but my time is sort of limited. Um, now, copyright registration is not required uh, for someone who has made an original work of authorship in a fixed tangible form of expression. It doesn't need to be registered to be protected by copyright. Is registration a good idea? Absolutely. It puts it's first of all, it's relatively inexpensive to do a, a copyright application online and protect a work or even a create a collection of works is only $55. It's a relatively simple uh, exercise to do online at the Library of, Con Library of Congress. And uh, typically, if you register your work within 90 days of publication or performance or display, uh, it will be uh, protected and in the event of a future infringement, you may be entitled to what are known as statutory damages and you do, which means you do not have to pre prove your actual damages, such as your lost profits, which can be a very expensive thing to try and prove. And in a provision that's very dear to me, if you've registered your work, you may also be entitled in a proper case to your attorney's fees if you have to prosecute the infringement. Uh, putting a copyright notice on your work is not required either, but again, it's a good idea because it, it puts people on notice that there is a copyright claim and that uh, there is something that they need to guard against. Um, the uh, term of copyright protection uh, is relatively long. It is the life of the author or and for a collaborative work, the life of the uh, last surviving author plus 70 years. So uh, this for valuable works that uh, have uh, long lasting value and that become iconic classic works, uh, this type of protection uh, is enormously valuable. Uh, Works for hire, on the other hand, have a fixed term. It's 95 years from publication or 120 years from the date of creation, whichever is shorter. Uh, but as you can see, for a relatively low cost uh, registration fee uh, and uh, a few minutes spent online to make that application, you may protect some uh, valuable intellectual property. Now, note that copyrights do not protect, you know, short phrases or fonts or things of that nature. Uh, and they only protect original works of authorship. Now, uh, although the uh, bar for what's original is not very high, uh, there, there are some limits. Uh, so in a very famous case, uh, there was a uh, maker of telephone books who uh, you know, had spent an enormous amount of time and effort in compiling you know, all of the names, addresses, telephone numbers for persons and compiled them in a directory. And then someone else went out and just knocked off the directory and made their own phone book and sold their own advertising. And the original author of the phone book had actually placed some phony names, some phony addresses, and some phony telephone numbers so they'd be able to show that this had been copied. And uh, sure enough, they were able 
uh, to uh, show that this had been copied. Went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, well, you know, we know that you put a lot of time and effort in, but how many ways can you protect a phone book? How many ways can you produce a listing of phone numbers other than doing it alphabetically by the last name of the person that uh, you're trying to locate? And the court in that instance found that there was the insufficient originality to provide the phone book with uh, protection. Now, uh, let me just talk briefly about transfers and sales of work um, that uh, are in the materials. Um, because I put in a provision there from a contract <clears throat> with one of the theater groups that I work with. Uh, number one concept for uh, a copyrighted work, transfer of the copyrighted work does not transfer the underlying copyrights in that work. What does that mean? If you buy a painting from an artist, that doesn't mean that you have purchased the underlying copyrights in that painting. You as the purchaser do not have the right to make copies. You as the purchaser do not have the right to make prints. You as the purchaser do not have the right to make greeting cards with that painting on it or t-shirts with that painting on it. Those rights remain with the artist unless the copyright has been transferred and uh, unless there's a writing to reflect that transfer of the copyright. And uh, if it's a transfer of exclusive rights, it absolutely must be in writing signed by the copyright owner or the owner's duly authorized agent. Now the contract provision that I'm referring to, I used an excerpt from the Dramatist Play Service Agreement that uh, has it's been a source of a number of works that have been uh, performed by the theater group that one of the theater groups I advise. But the license that's granted to perform that play is for a limited series of performances in a particular venue uh, for a particular period of time. And all other rights are reserved to the author and or the publisher. <clears throat> and they go on to make it plain that you are not granted the right to make a motion picture, to audio or uh, videotape this performance, to broadcast it on radio or TV or over the internet. So uh, for those of you who are you know, thinking about taking your performances and you know, broadcasting them in some way, what you need to do is you need to go back to the licensing agent. <clears throat> or if it's an original work, you need to make certain that when you're dealing with the original authors, that they've given you consent to use the work in the manner that you intend to use it. Uh, because the, in most typical licensing arrangements, if you can get a license for uh, the use that you're contemplating, um, it's you know, generally very limited and it's for a specific purpose for a specific period of time. Now, I, I see that I've gone past 2.30 and I know that um, there are a number of people who need to move on here. Um, I can try and answer uh, a couple of questions, you know, if Jen, if you want to uh, mod moderate and try and pose those questions to me, I'll try and answer them quickly. But uh, also on the materials that you were sent, uh, there is some contact information for me. If uh, after today's call, uh, anyone, you know, may wish to shoot me an email or uh, ask me a question, I can't undertake that I will get back to you immediately, but I will, you know, try and go through them uh, and get you an answer as best I can. Thank you so much, Les. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start from one of the first questions here and we'll kind of go down depending on how much time we have. Um, so the first question here is if we pay ASCAP dues, does that allow us to post a video with accompanying music? The 
the ASCAP license is for performance of a musical composition. Uh, it does not allow for the synchronization of that musical composition with video images. Um, the, uh, it, 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 for that, you need what's known as a synchronization license, which is a different license generally granted by the publisher and not by a performing rights organization like BMI or ASCAP. Great. All right, I have another ASCAP question. This one is a, a multiple part question. Um, let's see here. If a performance group has paid ASCAP for performance rights in a ticketed venue, and now that venue is online or virtual, but still private, a, is any additional licensing required? And B, if the streaming site has copyright detection algorithms built in, such as YouTube or Facebook, what steps can be done to tell them in advance the performer has permission so the stream does not have the audio shut off? Well, um, that's a, a very complex, que complex question. And the answer is, it depends. It depends on a, a number of factors. Um, you know, frequently when you post uh, materials on Facebook or you, YouTube, first of all, uh, you're essentially giving up your copyright claims and allowing Facebook and YouTube to use those materials any way that they wish. So there's that initial caution. Uh, again, um, if the performance venue, if your theater had a license for the performance of music and many theaters, <clears throat> many uh, other musical venues like bars and restaurants get an annual license from <clears throat> BMI, ASCAP and CSAC to perform their entire catalogs within that venue. Those licenses do not allow for uh, the recording and broadcast or other uses of that music, even though it may have been performed in that venue. Uh, typically, if what you're doing is you're making a recording, you need a license for that recording. The, the fact that it's a recording of a live performance doesn't change the fact that you are now synchronizing that music with audio and visual images for which you need a separate license. Great. Um, this next one is covering a little bit of YouTube. Uh, I've read that big platforms like YouTube and Facebook have blanket agreements with BMI ASCAP to cover musical pieces that users may upload. We play almost exclusively sheet music we purchased and are interested in sharing some songs online for our followers. If we can find that arrangement in YouTube's searchable catalog of songs covered under this agreement, are we able to upload and stream it? I think that <clears throat> I'm, I have to say I'm not familiar with, you know, the blanket licenses that YouTube and ASCAP uh, may have engaged in with Facebook. I do know that there are music publishers and record labels that have entire staffs of paralegals who do nothing else all day, but uh, look for their materials on YouTube and send YouTube takedown notices to make sure that those videos are taken down. And if there are repeat offenders uh, that continually post uh, li their licensed music that they uh, try to obtain uh, permanent uh, bars from those users using those platforms. So uh, it, again, there uh, may very well be a, a way to uh, contact Facebook and contact uh, uh, ASCAP to determine uh, in advance whether what you're posting uh, is within uh, some license that they may have obtained. Uh, but uh, typically, uh, if you're using, you know, uh, existing sound recordings uh, or musical compositions that uh, others have rights in, uh, you may be, you know, finding yourself the subject of a takedown notice for something posted on Facebook or YouTube. 
And if it's your own original music, you may uh, potentially uh, find that you've lost the right to control uh, how Facebook or YouTube may use that material if it chooses to do so. Great, thank you, Les. Um, I know we have a, a, some more conversation going on, but I think I will, I will follow up with you. Um, I know a lot of these have a lot of nuances and, and different ways that you can approach them. So if, if no one else has any specific uh, questions outside of the ones that, that we've briefly touched on, um, you know, less if there's any last remaining kind of points or words that you want to share with everyone. I, I know we're talking a lot in the arts field about what can we do during the time, during the pause order, order and remote working to move virtual, even, even beyond performances, you know, even classes and workshops, uh, yeah. instructional arts. Well, the last part of the materials that I didn't get to because I was sort of going over the time that's been allotted for this uh, workshop uh, is the whole concept of fair use. And notwithstanding the rights of copyright owners, there are certain uses of copyrighted material that are deemed fair, that are deemed uh, to advance the purposes of copyright protection and not necessarily to infringe on the rights of copyright owners. And uh, Unfortunately, it's not a bright line test. Uh, there's a four part test and it's towards the end of the materials that were circulated with the, the link for this call. And uh, I would encourage uh, folks to take a look at uh, those materials, but I wanna leave you with two thoughts. Uh, the first is that the more that you change the work, the more that it is transformative, uh, in that you take that original work and make it into something new and original of your own, the more likely it is to be deemed a fair use, particularly if it is for an, an educational or not-for-profit uh, type of use. Now, uh, just because you're a not-for-profit organization doesn't mean that the use you're making of the materials is not-for-profit particularly if you're selling admissions or selling subscriptions. Uh, the second uh, major consideration there is the effect of the use upon the potential market or value of the copyrighted work to its owner. So if you're doing something that is going to basically destroy the market for the copyright owner's work, it's unlikely that that's going to be deemed a fair use. Uh, so uh, those are important concepts. You know, not every uh, use of a copyrighted work uh, necessarily requires a license, but you know, what's a fair use? Again, it's fairly limited, and uh, it's a four-part test that lawyers scratch their heads over sometimes in trying to reconcile the cases, and uh, there are no bright lines. So you know, uh, venture out there carefully if you're uh, deciding to uh, go public with something digital or, or something published uh, or something broadcast and you don't have permission from the original copyright owner. Thank you so much, Les. Um, thank you, everyone. Great questions. Um, feel free to reach out to ASI after this. Uh, we'd be more than happy to put you in touch with any of the presenters if you have additional questions. Um, we will follow up uh, again with the materials and the links and the information. Uh, thank you so much, um, all five of you, for your time, um, for your expertise, and, and sharing with the group. Um, I feel that you know, as we have these conversations and we talk more and more, it's just the more information that we can have for the field to really navigate this changing time and what that looks like as as far as a point from programming to you know, moving into safety procedures and guidelines and reopening. It's just, we're juggling all these balls simultaneously in the air and it's just really helpful to hear, to hear from everyone and, and share everything uh, with the field just to help us get through onto the other side of this. So I thank all of our presenters. I thank everyone who attended today and uh, we hope to see you next week um, for our last presentation for the month for reopening and feel free to send us any questions or 
any information in the meantime. So I thank you all from ASI. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you soon. Hope everyone stays well. Thanks for having us.